this talk um, last week at the Interaction 17 conference. And one of the things that came through very clearly from that, from that week is that we're finally starting to realize that technology isn't neutral. Ne it never was. We used to believe, I think, that technology was a mere instrument. It was something that we made for people to achieve their goals. Something that we, you know, it really was just like people fulfilling their tasks and we just made the thing. And whether people used it then for, for good or for ill was really no concern of ours. And just because that was a predominant belief within technology, that didn't mean that it was correct. You sometimes hear in the field of ethics that an is does not make an ought. In 1980, the philosopher Langdon Winner asked the question, do artefacts have politics? His conclusion was essentially damn right they do. And the example that he gave was a chap called Robert Moses, New York City town planner, that New York City planner, who built intentionally low bridges so that he could deny minorities who tended to travel by bus, deny them access to Long Island beaches. And now that's a slightly disputed account, but it is pretty clear now that Moses had um, racist tendencies and that he had significant power that was vested in him through his position. Absolutely, the decisions that he made to do with the design of that space could have moral impact. It's a mistake to dissociate uh, technological capabilities from human ones. What actually happens is people and technologies act together in our environments. There are these, these interwoven and hybridized actors in our space. Things change what people can do and how they do it. It's true to say that guns don't kill people, but they sure as hell make it a lot easier for people to kill people. Now, I don't want to hyperbolize most of the things that we make aren't as morally charged as weaponry. But this belief in neutrality that we've clung to for so long, it allows us to abdicate responsibility for the impacts of our own work. And it gives us Microsoft Tay's racism. It gives us Facebook's emotional manipulation study. It allows companies like Uber to allegedly avoid their duties under disability regulation, or for Snapchat to launch racist filters described as digital blackface by some commentators. Over the next 10 or 20 years, the technology community is going to demand an awful lot of trust from its users. We're going to ask people to connect more and more of their lives to the products and the services that we built. We're going to ask them to trust us with the security of their homes and even their families. And this obstinate belief in, belief in uh, neutrality, this idea that we can wash our hands of the social, political and ethical responsibilities uh, implied there, that undermines that trust. Design is applied ethics. And for some objects, that relationship is particularly clear. We explicitly encode morality into the design of certain objects. We design them to prevent certain undesirable actions. We can think of volume limiters on an MP3 player, or speed bumps on the road, or a less pleasant example, homeless spikes, objects laden with their own, in this case, deeply unpleasant moral decisions. But every object we make uh, whether it has that kind of explicit morality or not, exists in the future. It, we are we're creating it for a projected future. So when we design, we make statements about futures that are preferable and that are not preferable. There's clearly an ethical component to that work. However, ethics uh, it has this reputation for being kind of dreary, right? It's, it's no dessert until you've finished your plate Or it's unrealistic. It's full of thou shalt not laws that require saintly behaviour. The framing that, that I like of ethics comes from Peter Paul Verbeek, and he says that ethics should accompany technological progress rather than necessarily directly opposing it. I think emerging technology particularly hosts a whole number of ethical questions uh, across categories like safety and persuasion, privacy and sustainability. But today, I'm going to talk about areas of intersection between AI and automation and uh, those ethical questions. I'll also try and suggest some responses for designers, for companies, and uh, for their communities as well. <clears throat> I think the promise of AI and of automation is, is pretty clear. 
Essentially, we can increase reliability, we can improve productivity. And we can see these essentially as extensions of industrial revolution principles. Higher output, lower prices, 24-hour economy, things like that. But it's not really just about replacing humans from existing processes. AI gives us the capability to go beyond. If we look at games, drafts, you may or may not know, has been completely solved now by AI. Chess may never be solved in sort of mathematical ways, but certainly the best AI players are significantly better now than the best human players. Go and poker and now sort of teetering on, on a bridge, uh, on the brink of a similar, similar collapse. Clearly, we can extend that into non-game scenarios. Really, any system that requires a balance of actions and responses is potentially going to succumb to this, this type of uh, outcome. So we have the prospect fairly soon of AIs being better than humans at, say, air traffic control or even something like fiscal policy. And we can go even further as well. AIs potentially give us the ability to solve things we don't even recognise as problems in the human experience. They can give us new capabilities that could have profound impacts on the human experience. Google's DeepMind division, for instance, just announced they now have an AI lip reader that's four times more accurate than any human lip reader. Imagine the enormous social impact if that te technology becomes commoditized and widespread. One of the clearest ethical issues uh, in this domain is, is that of bias. And we've known this even since the 1980s. It's a medical school um, application sorting algorithm, uh, I think up in Scotland, that was found to bias against women and people with uh, non-European sounding names. Today we have police departments and criminal justice systems that use algorithms to predict things like criminal risk. And ProPublica, when they analysed one of these algorithms, they found that it guaranteed black defendants would be inaccurately identified as future criminals more often than their white counterparts. Of course, this contradicts the very idea of neutrality. Maciej Sadowski from uh, Pinboard says it very nicely, which is that machine learning is money laundering for bias. In other words, it looks clean, but the smell remains. I think there are two sources uh, for, for bias, really. There's the training data um, for, your, for your system, and then there's the algorithm itself. Now, in the case of Microsoft Tay, the, the racist and sexist and Holocaust-denying chatbot, Really, the, the problem came, seriously, I know, um, the problem came uh, from both of those sources. They'd chosen the bad corpus for a start. They'd trained the data on the internet. they trained the algorithm on the internet and chat rooms and, and message boards and all this sort of thing. But they'd also made the mistake that the algorithm allowed that corpus to be reinforced through action, through call and response on Twitter. So people essentially could train Tay to say bad things. And then they compounded that by not putting in basic stop words. Clearly we have a duty to uh, not release everything, right, unless we have had a look for uh, potential biasing factors in both the data and the algorithm. And if we find that sort of bias, I think ethically we certainly have a duty to notify our user base and to fix that problem. But there are some commentators who say that we need to go further. They say that we need to have some third party, some body that has the power to scrutinise these algorithms on demand. The challenge there is, of course, some of these algorithms are fundamentally inscrutable, particularly those using uh, things like neural networks, deep learning, and so on. It's this complex blend of inputs and outputs that we can't actually unpick and understand in retrospect. Another interaction and intersection, I suppose, between um, AI and automation and ethics comes from a natural designer instinct, which is to hide complexity in systems. You know, we like to create simple models that are easily understood um, for our technologies, but that black boxing can become double-edged. The risk here is that we reduce user agency in that system, by which I mean the ability for people to exercise free will, for them to interrogate and control the systems at their disposal. And I think that risk is exaggerated or increased when we look at the Internet of Things. In that world, data pours off every surface and every interaction. And it's passed between these cooperating devices and services. It gets aggregated and spliced and recombined in new ways. And to simplify that interaction, we have to obscure it. But that very opacity is the danger. It means that the IoT could be a breeding ground for unethical behaviour. 
the IoT botnet that we already see is in full swing. That's really come about because of a combination of poor security models and a reduction in user agency. So designers have to start being alert to that risk when trying to, you know, making this, this idea of seamless technology. Maybe instead of seamlessness, we should replace it with demanding honesty when exposing data flows and the nature of interactions in these complex systems. Kelsey Campbell Dollahan says it nicely, which is that we have to demand friction and truth from the products we use. And when I talk about agency, it's not just a question of understanding what's happening in these systems. Do we also allow users the ability to disagree, to override those conclusions? Can they take moral control of that situation? And what's the distribution of responsibility anyway? If my personal AI breaks a social norm or worse breaks a law, then who's accountable for that error? And these issues then of agency and control, they, get, they become particularly important when we look at intelligent physical devices. Uh, and most obviously self-driving cars are the, uh, the vector for this. The trolley problem um, is probably the most well-known ethical experiment or ethical issue, I suppose, in, in that space right now. And its roots are as a thought experiment. Essentially, who should be struck by a, an unstoppable runaway um, railway cart? And you can, you, know, you can change the points and choose, choose the victim. And there are lots of configurations of this. Do you kill one person to save two criminals, for instance? Clearly, there are some parallels here with autonomous vehicles, particularly when, say, their brakes fail, or something like that. It's going to be down to the software, and therefore to us, the architects of that software, to decide the priority of lives. This is MIT's attempt to understand that problem. They created what they call the moral machine. Essentially, it's the crowdsourcing um, of multiple scenarios to get the general public to say, well, who do we think should be struck in these, in these unstoppable vehicle situations? And we've started to see some fairly different approaches emerge already. For instance, Mercedes uh, announced last year that in this situation, they will protect the driver above everything else. That's perhaps not a huge surprise coming from Mercedes, but I think there is some logic actually to their approach, which is that they're trying to save the one person they know they can save, or at least protect the best they can. But the main use, to be honest, of the trolley problem is actually just as an, an entry point to ethical discussion in this field. It's actually extremely unlikely to happen in practice. The Google self-driving car project, uh, now called Waymo, it's got hundreds of thousands of miles of real road experience by now, and they've yet to encounter uh, this problem. A chap called Andrew Chatham, who's one of their lead engineers, says, well, it takes some of the intellectual intrigue out of the problem, but the answer is almost always slam on the brakes. <coughs> Nor is this problem even unique to automation, to AI. A researcher by the name of Joanna Bryson points out that people who buy an SUV have already made the choice to protect themselves and to endanger anyone that they hit. So the trolley problem for me really masks deeper conundrums with automated vehicles. One is liability. What's the role of, say, insurance in the future space of autonomous traffic? KPMG say that the number of crashes uh, they expect that to go down 80% by 2040. Will pedestrians become the new kings of the road, knowing they can just step out into traffic at any time, knowing that cars will have to stop for them? What about firmware? Do we have to, up, do we have to disable a user's vehicle because they haven't done an operating system update in the last 30 days? And again, these issues of agency and accountability, uh, as in this, this New York cartoon, I or not. <laughs> but the biggest challenge is going to be around the handover of control. Because it's a mistake to think of automation and of AI as a fully binary yes-no type thing. It's going to come to the market partially and incrementally. This is a semi-legible framework um, from the Society of Automotive Engineers. And it's been adopted by the NHTSA, the US body that's in charge of essentially road safety. And it describes different levels of automation, from level zero, essentially um, no automation at all, it's just warning lights and things like that, right down to level five, which is really where a driver's only responsibility is to tap in any legal address, and then the car will do the rest in any conditions. But the most challenging from a control and 
potentially from a design perspective, are these levels in the middle, levels one, two, and three perhaps. Because the risk comes in that handover of control, that transition, what I call a deadly seams. The University of Southampton study was published last month, and they did simulator uh, studies of this, this situation, and they found that drivers needed between 1.9 and 25 seconds, 25 seconds, to regain full control in, uh, in handover situations. Now, they did have some that were shorter, um, but in those cases, they found what they called a stress transition process, which is called swerving, lane changes, and dangerous braking. Now, human factors engineers have known about this risk um, for a little while, actually. They've studied control rooms and cockpits in, in early aircraft, uh, and they've known that emergency transitions can cause um, big problems, particularly what's known as a startle effect, uh, particularly if there are sounds or um, visual alerts, the user can actually freeze and not really understand what's happening and become a sort of uh, archetypal rabbit in the headlights, I suppose. The crash of Air France 447 that you may remember a couple of years ago, that was caused essentially by a scenario a bit like this. There was an emergency handover, the autopilot switched off uh, automatically in rare atmospheric conditions, and the pilots uh, were confused by this and misread their instruments, uh, entering a fatal spiral of bad control decisions. Now designers can try and combat this, we can try and layer modalities, we can use haptics and highlights to direct attention and things like that, but there's always a danger in these transitions. And at any level of automation that isn't level five, that isn't complete automation, the user has to be aware, has to be fully aware of the level of automation that's available to them. Any user of Siri or Alexa, you know the difficulty that comes with the invisible affordance. You don't know what the thing can and can't do. You have to try and remember. So Tesla, they have an autopilot, as you're aware, um, in, their, in their machines now. Um, for me, I think that gives a dangerous impression of the capability of that system. It suggests perhaps a level three level of automation. It's closer, in fact, to level one or level two. I'd argue it's a, le it's a name that's been chosen more for marketing than for safety. It's worth noting that the first uh, man killed in an autonomous vehicle, a man called Joshua Brown, uh, was reportedly watching a Harry Potter DVD at the time of the crash. And we can't discuss automation without considering its limits. What shouldn't we automate? Last July, the Dallas Police Department killed uh, a suspect called Michael Xavier Johnson. Uh, during a standoff, and this was unique because they, they killed him by one of these, a recon robot that they had rigged with C4 explosive and sent in to where he was, was hidden and blew up. It's the first time a robot's been used to kill um, intentionally on US soil. Now, from a moral and a legal point of view, this is probably not too challenging. This isn't, a, this isn't an autonomous <coughs> weapon, this was controlled by remotes, so it was essentially a drone dealing death at a, at a distance. Johnson had killed five police officers, and clearly the, the cops were authorised to use lethal force. And clearly this intervention is a lot safer than going in on foot. <coughs> but that said, let's examine that decision and that, that interaction. The choice to use a robot meant there was no immediate threat to life in that interaction. So was the killing actually justified? Were there not opportunities instead to disable the perpetrator? The lethality of that intervention was chosen as if it were a human intervention. The law professor by the name of Ryan Kahlo uh, makes a very good point that the human SWAT officer might have made a different call in that moment uh, of, of, of context, but the choice to kill was instead made in the operations room when they decided that this was how they were going to do it, rather than that, that point of context. The robot essentially collapsed the context. And as autonomy starts to creep further and further into situations like this, it's likely we'll see more robots used for offensive situations. And in the hands of increasingly militarized police and increasingly authoritarian regimes, there's a potential this becomes a vector for further abuses of power. And of course, there are security implications as well. This, this robot was operated wire wirelessly. Does that mean that it's potentially vulnerable to hacking? Warfare is, of course, the forefront of these ethical decisions. Should we as a species permit fully autonomous weapons? Would a robot army make nations more belligerent 
in the knowledge that in the initial skirmish there are fewer human lives at risk. Now, this is heavy stuff, right? We just sort of lean back and say, oh, yeah, okay, but we, we make apps, we make software. Sure, but this is the forefront of the debate and the conclusions and the norms that emerge at that level will start to trickle down into our work over the coming years. And let's finish this section by moving from death to taxes. <laughs> it's, clear, it's clear that automation is going to have some profound economic impacts. Uh, and those impacts are mostly going to be felt by low-paid service workers. Drivers, repairers, clerks, cashiers, secretaries, who now face widespread disemployment in the coming years. And as participation in the workforce drops, the influence of capital in economies can only grow. So automation may well be a vector for further inequality. But technologists struggle to wrestle with these issues. They, they, they really Canonize disruption as a uniquely positive force. If you object, then you're a, an enemy of progress, you're a neo-Luddite. But I think the community has a duty to reflect on whether those politically entrenched views are actually helping or harming. And of course then to explore how can we try and mitigate some of those economic impacts. So some economists and technologists are now experimenting with the idea of the universal basic income. Um, interesting trials spinning up, but far too slow when we have, uh, at some estimates, 50% of all jobs at risk of, uh, essentially, dissolution within the next decade or two. History tells us that disruption often ruins an industry before it creates a viable replacement for it. So I think it's clear that this is fertile territory for ethical discussion over the coming years. The question then becomes, how do we respond to and address those challenges? And I see three levels that we can try. The first is the individual, and then the company, and then through the community. But let's start closest to home. The most important change that we can make is, of course, in our own behavior. We become more moral by working at it. Living well isn't some accidental gift. It takes awareness and courage uh, to reflect on the choices we make and the impacts that they have. Because it's so easy to sleepwalk into harm. Hannah Arendt talks about the uh, banality of evil, the idea that harm is often done by those who are simply motivated by blind self-interest, rather than because they subscribe to some evil ideology. I want to draw on a bit of ethical theory, uh, the three main branches, if you like, of, of contemporary ethics and translate them into four tests or provocations that people like us can use to examine the moral impact of our choices. The first test is, what if everyone did what I'm about to do? Would a world in which this action was taken by everyone, if it became a universal law of behaviour, would that be a better or a worse place? And this idea of universalising action comes from Immanuel Kant, it comes from what's known as the categorical imperative. Kant's what we call a deontologist. It means that he sees value in moral laws. Some things are just right to someone like Kant, who believes in duty, moral obligation. And it's a perspective that tends to prompt fairly conservative behaviour. It, it suggests the preservation of common good. If I have, say, a biased algorithm, then this test certainly won't let me release it, because Clearly, that whole space becomes really unpleasant for everyone if we all do that. Another deontological question. Am I treating people as, as ends or as means? This is also Kant and it's what's called the third formulation of his categorical imperative. Now this needs a bit of unpacking, I think. For designers, this is really about what's the role of users in this system? Am I treating them as means for me to achieve my own goals? Or am I respecting them as free individuals with their own goals superordinate to my own? You know, I don't think designers struggle with that question. Uh, I think that idea of the user as end in themselves is something that's central to the way designers think. But I do think it's a question that data-driven companies need to ask themselves more. Because too often in those companies, the framing of users starts to shift with time. People become not the raison d'etre, but the subjects of experimentation as means for us to hit targets. 
People essentially become masses, and when that happens, I think unethical design is the natural consequence. Or if I'm designing, say, automating technology, the role of humans in that system is, frankly, people I'm going to replace. Are we happy with that being the outcome, the, the role of people within our work? Now, the downside of what's called this deontological approach is because it focuses on rules and duty, it's quite rigid. If you're Immanuel Kant, you're not really allowed to lie to an axe murderer who asks where your family's hiding. So it makes it quite easy to dismiss all this stuff, that it's, it's impractical, it's not grounded in the reality of our individual decisions. So we might turn to utilitarianism. It's an idea that you're probably familiar with. The idea of maximising happiness for the greatest number of people. And by extension, minimising suffering, of course. And this is what we call a consequentialist perspective. Meaning that it's not about following a particular rule, but it's about making choices based on the consequences, the impacts of our work. And you know, this feels promising, I think. It feels like there's some sort of natural social justice here. And the public seems to think that way too. That moral machine MIT study for the trolley problem I showed you earlier, that essentially came up with a, a utilitarian outcome. But how do we assess this happiness thing? I mean, this is a problem designers have had for a long time. Jeremy Bentham, who was the philosopher who proposed it, suggests something called the philosophic calculus with all sorts of dubious equations and mnemonics. It's the sort of thing that sends some techies scrabbling for pseudoscience, putting people in MRI scans and things like that. But I think for a working designer, it's really just about deep research. It's about testing prototypes in context so we can understand the real impacts of our work. And then it's pausing to think of what are the second order effects, what are the unintended consequences of the things we're about to do. As I say, the nice thing about this approach is it grounds us in impact and it can help to illuminate angles that we wouldn't have otherwise looked at. But the downside is, well, am I really going to perform this sort of arithmetic for every decision I make? That seems pretty unrealistic. And then second, secondarily, um, Utilitarianism permits grave injustice if people want it, uh, the tyranny of the majority. If 99% of a population wants to exile or execute a 1% minority, well, utilitarianism at least leaves the door open for that conversation to happen. It also suggests that you should kill one person so that their organs can save five. It doesn't really care about duty in that Kantian sense or the moral motivation behind action. So we have one final perspective to look at. Would I be happy for this action to be published in tomorrow's papers? This is what's known as the front page test sometimes. And it's grounded really in the third pillar of modern ethics, which is called virtue ethics. And that's not about rules and it's not about outcomes really, but it's about moral character and the motives. Why have we done something? It's an approach that stresses accountability. Would you sign your name publicly to the thing you're about to do? And then particularly, it causes you to pay attention to the sort of person you are and the sort of person that you want to be. It's not really about the act, per se, but the identity and your character. And I think that's where a lot of moral reasoning really sits. Again, this has a downside. The most obvious one is really we're acting out of a fear of embarrassment here. That's, that feels like shaky ground for truly moral action. If we're not doing something only because people would criticise, I think Immanuel Kant, for instance, would object fairly strongly to that. Now these tests are obviously just entry points, vastly oversimplifying a history of moral philosophy. Um, but I think they're, they're good provocations. And I think when you start applying this sort of thinking, you might find they give you conflicting uh, answers. The different lenses that you choose might suggest different courses of action. And you know, I think that's fine, that's healthy. Ethics is complicated after all. Um, unless you find your flip-flopping to find the one answer that want to do. But I think these tests work um, on a number of levels. I think they work obviously with things like tactical design issues. Dark patterns are probably the, the most obvious way that we encounter ethical challenge early in our careers. But they also work with broader and, and potentially more challenging questions as well, such as what sort of career do I want to have? Well, let's look at what a good career might be. 
The ethics of particular business models and verticals is a particularly hot topic uh, within our field and has been made for a couple of years, uh, and particularly the ethics of advertiser funded uh, business models. And I think it's, it's a shame because there's so much flimsy argumentation and, and sloganeering in that space. One saying that by now we've all heard, which is uh, that if you're not paying for the product, you are the product being sold. I think it's a really cute soundbite, and I don't think it stands up to any kind of analysis, because the implication there is that every two-sided platform <coughs> is unethical, in which case you can wave goodbye to credit cards, to classifieds, to recruiters, to comparison services, to brokers, to taxi companies. The implication that the only ethical model is one where the consumer is paying, that's itself political and exclusionary of people on low incomes, of children, and so on. My belief is there really aren't many verticals or models that are inherently unethical, except for most of those that we've made illegal. The better challenge for me is, does the job or gig you're looking at, does it reflect the designer and the person that you want to be? Jan Chipche says it well, the money you turn down defines you just as much as what you take on. However, I do think there are two tips that I can offer. The first is to look at a company's attitude to accessibility, because that demonstrates their ethical values. Some will ignore it altogether. Some, probably most, will treat accessibility as an issue of legal compliance. What do we need to do to avoid action or to satisfy the rudimentary basics? But a rare few companies will see accessibility for what it really is, which is to say it's an ethical commitment to treat all human beings with the respect that they deserve. Clearly we need to embrace those companies. My second tip is not to fall into the trap of thinking you can change it from the inside. This, I think, is what people say when they know they've compromised on their ethics. In truth, you can't change the company of a culture unless you are vastly senior or it's a very early stage company. And even then, it's not a guarantee. Culture, more than anything else, dictates ethical values and actions. And culture has a way of, of lingering. So morality and moral actions start, of course, with the individual, but we never act alone in these environments. We have to convince our colleagues, our superiors, to take these choices seriously as well. And anyone who's been in this field for a long time, we, we've had the business case and the ROI discussion for, for decades, it seems. It's a topic that we've really run dry. There are really only three categories for any business case. You either generate revenue, you reduce cost, or you reduce risk. If you can build an ethical case on any of those things, you can generate revenue by differentiating your product through its ethics, by reaching new audiences through inclusive design, increasing retention of your users. You can reduce cost by saving money on customer service requests and complaints, by retaining staff better and by <coughs> making recruitment easier. You can reduce risk by avoiding negative press, user backlash, and regulatory action. <coughs> But it isn't possible for any one person to be involved in every single decision that has an ethical component to it. Uh, you have to find a way to abstract that influence, to, to create what I'd call ethical infrastructure within your company, to weave it into the fabric of your organisation. I think design critique is a really good place for that. Um, in the book um, Design for Real Life, Eric Meyer and Sarah Wachtabetcher talk about uh, a role of designated dissenter. And this is mostly a design crit role. You appoint someone to be a constructive antagonist. Their role is to challenge default assumptions, to subvert the things that look obvious. And I think the closest analogy I can find for this is, is actually the QA engineer. So a QA person will test a system rigorously by throwing it, deliberately challenging input, and seeing how the system responds. I think this is essentially doing the same for the design and prototyping and iteration process. I think a diverse team, of course, has value as um, an early warning system for ethical misconduct, because a homogenous group of people would, of course, prioritize the potential impact on people like them. But if you have a team that has diverse inherent traits and acquired experiences, they can be better able to anticipate if you're heading down the wrong path. Clearly there's been some encouraging talk about this in our field over the last couple of years, that's great, 
And we are making progress, but I also think we still have a long way to go. But the best approach, of course, is to get first-hand perspectives into your process. I think most unethical design happens because the thinking is just too insular. What we need is the outward orientation that research provides. That almost inoculates us against that mistake. It focuses the team on the presence and the humanity of other people in these systems. So I think it's important that we give space and time for researchers and designers to really explore the potential human impacts of their work. We also need to make sure that the research pools that we operate with, that they're as broad in terms of perspectives um, as, our, as hopefully our team is. Maybe we need to, if we have sufficient consent and care, research stressful scenarios, because I think that's where a lot of those um, really ethical flashpoints uh, will arise. And of course, that research itself should be conducted according to good ethical guidelines. There's a, a, an IDEO book that I'll, I'll reference at the end that mentions those in some detail. It can be useful as well in the company to try and capture ethical values in policies and documents. And mostly the, the best vehicles for that are things like core values or design principles. And core values, um, you know, they, they, they get a bad rep sometimes. They're seen sometimes as vague and idealistic, paying lip service really to the idea. But I have seen them work very well. And when they do, they become powerful drivers of trying to do the right thing. They spell out, if you want, the kind of company that we all want this thing to be. <coughs> design principles, then, really make that sort of stuff concrete. They offer direct guidance, or, or tiebreakers, if you like, for design decisions. And as such, they're really good vehicles for you to deep freeze some ethical <coughs> decisions that you've made. And of course, there are other documents that might be useful as well. Data and privacy policies, whistleblower policies, for instance. Something like Sarbanes-Oxley, um, particularly in the States, gives a lot of um, cover for reporting financial misconduct. But what about within your own companies? What's the uh, response going to be if an employee feels they have a moral duty to whistleblow on bad behaviour? And then how do you balance that with dissuading malicious leaks? But as I mentioned before, really the, the largest influence on, on ethical values is, is culture. And that's mostly an artifact of senior leadership and their words and their actions. I think if you're a practitioner, it's vital if you look at the words and actions of your current leadership and any leadership you may be considering working for in the future. <coughs> if you're lucky enough to be one of those leaders, then you have to recognise that your words and actions set ethical norms. They trickle and permeate throughout the entire organisation. In the aftermath of the VW emissions scandal, the group chief exec, a guy called Martin Winkerhorn, he told investigators he didn't see how he could possibly be uh, implicated in this. It's dead wrong. He created a culture that fostered unethical decision making. To my mind, he had to go. So there are some particular leadership actions that will contribute to ethical cultures and conduct. I'll just mention three. The first is there have to be incentives for positive ethical behavior and also punishment for negative ethical should absolutely be firing people for ethical misconduct. I also think there's real value in leaders adopting um, what's known as the servant leadership mentality, which I dare say some, those of you in leadership roles have heard of. Um, there's actually a, a parallel here with Plato, uh, who said in the, in the Republic that the best leader is the re reluctant leader, who does it really as a last resort. But the most important thing for me is Companies should start talking about ethics as, a, as an open and ongoing and really complex challenge. Too often we see it as one-off compulsory training, you know the sort of thing where you do a video module and you tick the box? That really doesn't engage people with the, the complexity of these ongoing issues. I want to close by looking at some of the ethical norms and the cultures of our broader communities. And forgive me, I have to get a little bit political here. Because the more I dive into this particular field, the less able I am to separate ethics and politics. The prevailing politics of the tech industry is, the closest analogy I can come up with is, it's kind of like a creme brulee. We've got this dense shell of executive and VC libertarianism up top. And underneath this gooey practitioner centre of liberalism. 
And there's this really unusual mix of what we'd consider left and right perspectives, uh, something that uh, has been called the Californian ideology. But it's, the reason those sit together is I think there are some shared beliefs between both of those groups. The first is a belief in technological determinism, the idea that a culture is shaped primarily by its technology. And actually, I'm probably a bit guilty of that in this talk. But this suggests a whole ton of ethical questions for me, because it gives technologists an enormous amount of power over culture. Well, who appointed us to that role in the first place? And more importantly, how and when can people remove us from that position of power? Another shared belief between these unlikely political bedfellows is the idea of internet exceptionalism. The idea that the internet can kind of root around old systems of control, that it should be exempt from politics and regulations. It's a sort of romantic idea that the internet was going to unify humanity. I think in 2017, we find that to be a painfully naive idea. But it's rooted in this idea of freedom. Now, freedom is a slippery political word. Um, but when we come to the internet, the sort of freedoms we're discussing here tend to be freedom from regulation, freedom from hierarchies of access, freedom from constraints on speech and sometimes consequences of speech. Or if you're talking to, say, a Bitcoin enthusiast, they would say freedom from monetarist policy, from taxation, from, from wealth redistribution. Is it right that technology feels it can root around elected governments? How can we balance that sort of individualised and anti-statist leaning with more collectivist cultures. Another common belief is the role of data. It almost becomes an ideology in its own right. We see this most clearly with Lean Startup, which is now the dominant belief system uh, in the tech industry. And the principles behind it, I think, are sound, but mostly it manifests as rapid empiricism. Build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn. There's no space there for prediction, for intuition, for framing problems up front. Everything's subservient to the data, uh, and that data is almost always quantitative. Finally, there's this belief in separating private and public morality. This is default thinking in capitalism generally. This is the belief that you kind of have to be unethical sometimes in political life or business or public life. The belief that we all have an inner Machiavelli. Nice guys finish last. It's not personal any business. I think that's a harmful idea. I do see its grip slipping, however. And I think the transparency and freer communication of, of the internet can help hold people to personal account for their professional actions. Now, I think we have a duty to wrestle with the political implications of our work, because the choice not to engage with that politics, that itself is a political act, to vote in favour of the status quo. For me, it suggests new roles for ethical designers and technologists. Maybe to highlight the effects of these political norms and to reject some of their harmful aspects. Maybe for designers to help build external pressure and accountability on our own field. Maybe to design tools for the public to contest, uh, contest hegemony and um, abuses of power. Maybe to encourage new structures and priorities for businesses. Business ethics courses sometimes talk about regulation as kind of an ethical backstop, uh, the ultimate means of preventing bad behaviour. And there are some schools of thought that say, actually, this uh, legality is really the only ethical boundary that we should be uh, observing. Leave the idea of what's right and wrong to, to law. But I think that's particularly dangerous when it comes to technology. Regulation is definitely important, but it's not going to be sufficient. It's not enough. Particularly in this era of such fluidity, we can't rely on regulation as a deus ex machina to solve our ethical problems. Innovation will always outpace the law, and particularly in the West, the appetite for regulation seems to be waning. So then some people suggest maybe we need to create our own semi-binding set of rules. We need to systematise guidelines into a you know, code of ethics, or something like that. And I think it's a praiseworthy idea. I think it's sensible, and I don't think it'll work for interaction design. A couple of reasons. The first is I, I worry it creates a checklist ethics approach, where we no longer deeply engage with ethical questions, but we simply tick the box if we have behaved according to the letter of the law. I think it would need enforcement. The reason it works in, say, medicine or architecture is because you have a third party, a body with the power to officiate and to disbar 
practitioners once they break that code. We don't have a body like that, and I don't think we even want one. And thirdly, I think these rules would either have to be far too precise or far too vague for such a, a rapidly moving field to be actually useful. So I think it's down to us, in our everyday work, to engage with the ethical impacts of what we do, to hold each other to account for the decisions that they make. And that's difficult and complex and uncomfortable work. But that's the nature of ethics. If it's easy, it's probably not an ethical question. But I do think, by engaging with that, it's probably the only way that we can gain the trust that we need so badly over the coming decades. Now, I tried to camouflage some of the theory that will sort of throw philosophy at you too much. Clearly, I can't claim that that's my own work. Um, there's a reading list here. I also tweeted it a couple of days ago, so on Twitter, have a look, and there's that nice big high-res picture. Um, not taking Q&A, but I'd love to chat afterwards. Uh, particularly, I'm writing a book on the topic, so if you have any relevant war stories or um, things that would be uh, interesting for that, then I'd love to hear more. And thanks for your time. <laughs>